Jingri. Jingri. That's hello in the Yugumbe language. But long ago, it was just the call of a little bird called the Willy Wagtail. Jingri Jingri, we now call him. But he used that sound to gather all the animals, the animals of the land, the sky, and the sea. And they engaged in a great battle between the three of them to decide who would be Gamai Bungil, the greatest. And in this battle, Goanna brought a spear, which was stolen by Bugaban, the sparrowhawk. And he speared Gowanda, the dolphin, creating his gulpa, his blowhole. And when he blew the spear from his back, all of the gung, the water, rushed out, creating the wetlands that stretched all the way across the area of the northern Gold Coast. And after that battle, little Jingari Jingari gathered all the animals again at the heads of Bagul, the brown snake, and they gave a piece of themselves. The green tree frog, Jaran, gave his hand, old man kangaroo gave his thigh, and the lyrebird gave his voice box. And from all those pieces, they formed the first Mibbin. First man. Those many animals are still known to this day as our Yori, totems, totems of the Yugumbe nation. And they came together in a spirit of Garaban. Garaban means equivalent exchange. It is the flow of society and people. And Garaban is the most important element of that story that I want each of you to carry with you in your day-to-day -day lives, in each of your own enterprises. Nyanyabu, may I see you again. Hello, woman Jenka, Kiora. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you're joining today's conversation, I think we've got people from Germany, Spain, New Zealand, Australia, people from all around the globe. Hello, my name is Bryce Ives, and this is Repurpose How Australian Social Enterprises Are Redefining Prosperity. This crucial conversation couldn't come at a more important moment in time. Now we asked you on the chat before how you're feeling and, and many of you are feeling hopeful. And I am too, with the Social Enterprise World Forum coming ahead in Brisbane in September this year. But also I must acknowledge up front that these are unusual and uncanny times. We're talking about redefining prosperity and a global pandemic is raging on around us. A time where we've experienced loss, grief, We've been pushed to face things that we couldn't have imagined only a few years ago. And right now, today, we're bearing witness to the horrors of the unfolding war in Ukraine. And we're trying to make sense of what we see and what we hear. Closer to home in these past few weeks, we've witnessed the worst flooding that Queensland and New South Wales has ever seen in its history. So in times like these, it feels that redefining prosperity is not a nice thing to do or a polite thing to do. Reconsidering purpose is not a marketing catch cry or, or some buzzwords that sit on your strategic plan. Instead, these are things that we simply must be doing right now. And that's what today's conversation is all about. How Australian social enterprises are redefining prosperity. A conversation to kick start a year of important gatherings and events in the lead up to the Social Enterprise World Forum in September this year. Now you may be wondering, who do we have online today? Well, we are trying to broaden the conversation to include as many as possible. We're of course talking about social enterprises and the social enterprise sector, locally and globally. We're talking businesses, big and small. Businesses committed to doing good and creating a better future. We're talking about the not-for-profits, the charities, the collectives. We're talking about 
the certified B corporations of which I'm proudly a representative of. We're talking about individuals and communities who believe at this moment in time, well, we must have shared purpose. Individuals who believe that we have an obligation to lead the way now. And to my mind, if we are hosting the Social Enterprise World Forum, our obligation is deep. And that's what today's conversation is about. Now, I want to thank Sean Davies for that beautiful acknowledgement of country. I'm coming to you on the lands of the Gadigal people who have gathered, collaborated, and shared their stories for over 60,000 years. And behind me is this magnificent artwork by Jason Wing and Maddie Gibbs. If we are going to redefine prosperity, and if we're going to take a genuine bird's eye view of social enterprise globally, well, First Nation voices cannot be on the periphery. Instead, they must be up front and centre. And why? Because First Nations connection to land, to community, to people living on the land, well, those frameworks are what should begin any conversation around prosperity. Now, today's event has been presented by the Westpac Foundation, Torrens University, White Box Enterprises, the Social Enterprise World Forum, Digital Storytellers, and the Social Enterprise State Networks. In this hour, you are going to hear from businesses for good, like Who Gives a Crap, the APY Art Collective, and Taboo. These are businesses creating real impact within communities now, every day and every way. Now, to set the scene, let's remind ourselves of what's ahead. The Social Enterprise World Forum, coming to Brisbane in 2022. Jingri. Jingri. That's hello in our Yugumbe language. Remember the Garaban. Remember the Gubong. For those are the words of this Gaurima that I give to you so that your event may have its own piece of Garaban. Thank you. Nyanyabu. In times of global change and global crisis, what really matters is the work in the communities. And that's why I think social enterprises matter even more than before now, because they have the drive and the passion, and they have the knowledge and the learning in order to grow healthier, more sustainable and stronger communities, and help us transition towards that accessible and inclusive impact economy. The Social Enterprise World Forum actually creates the connections that you couldn't find any other way and gives you the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face or a digital conversation with those people and really advance your thinking and find those collaborators that you can share with right across the world. It's no small feat to organise an international event and especially at the moment. It will be such a fantastic opportunity to collaborate and learn from other countries, shine a light on the great work already being done here in Australia and to attract new investors who are keen to be part of the bright future of social enterprises. Australia has the oldest continuous living culture in the world. We have a history of engagement and trade and business. And that's something that we're really excited to share with the rest of the world. The Social Enterprise World Forum 2022 stylized design represents a meeting place and it's the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that were here way before colonial times. I think social enterprises are going to change the world and I've really noticed that in Australia social enterprises are really honest and understanding of the privilege that we have in the country that we live in. I love the fact that business can be the vessel of change and I'm excited to see how people are being quite innovative and creative with their businesses to achieve some of the work that they want to do. When the eyes of the world are on Australia, this is our chance to really raise our profile and be recognised in the wider community. So the chance this year is for coming together with those that are passionate about social enterprise, those who are trying to build the networks across the country, to come together in the same room would be fantastic. So I just can't wait to see so many friends and peers in Brisbane. I was privileged to be in Ethiopia in 2019 at, at that edition of the Social Enterprise World Forum and the notion 
that we will be creating something similar together in September in Brisbane this year. Well, that is giving me tingles. And I, I really hope today's conversation is like a grand opera. Uh, across the course of the year, there'll be many events and many initiatives that connect us together. But we don't want the focus to just be on the grand finale in September. Today is like the overture of the opera. And this is where we start to imagine what the conversations can be. And like any opera, there'll be moving arias and big chorus scenes, grand moments, more intimate moments. But also like any opera, the music should continue well after the performance has ended. That resonance, that echo. So the call to action is simple. You're going to join the chorus today. We're going to make an exceptional symphonic sound. And that big finale in September, well, that's only the beginning of something more. Purposefully, this event is for two audiences today. There are those of us who already know about social enterprise. We're the ones who probably know what SEWF means, all the acronyms, and we're rusted on. So hello to you. But also, we have online today students, community members, business owners, and others who might be new to the social enterprise sector. If this is you, today's event is the perfect opportunity to understand the sector's power firsthand. And in this hour, you will hear incredible stories from real communities that benefit from social enterprises and chance to connect with leaders who are driving real change. Like our first story. In early 2016, two high school besties, Isabel and Eloise, attended an inspiring leadership conference where they were first introduced to the notion of the social enterprise model of business. You fast forward six years and Taboo, is one of the extraordinary stories of the social enterprise sector. Check it out. Period. 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 Period poverty is when someone can't afford or access the products or services they need to deal with their period well. If you don't have access to menstrual products, then that has really detrimental flow and effects to your life. No pun intended, I guess. <laughs> the fact that we'd never questioned it, or no one had ever, um, I guess, told us or talked to us about that, um, was a bit of a red flag in itself. Taboo really started when my co-founder Izzy and I were walking down the beach as high school students. We, we were heartbroken hearing about how many girls were going, not going to school because they couldn't afford period products. And then they were getting married and having babies at 13, 14, instead of getting an education and thinking that pads could actually be the thing that stops them. We crowdfunded 56 grand to kickstart Taboo. And that's a big achievement when you've got nearly $60,000 worth of other people's money in your hands. So Taboo has now been running for five years uh, and so much of our mission is focused around sparking the conversation around periods uh, so that the right conversations are had in the right spaces. Taboo is a 100% social enterprise. I've designed a Pad It Forward program, which is its nickname, where people around wherever really subscribe on behalf of another woman in Australia to our period products. So we've got a, a host of maybe 1,400 pads at the moment that we're redistributing across the country. For example, an organisation called Vinnie's Crisis Centre who look after women who are fleeing domestic violence scenarios. We also have a partnership with Red Lily Health who work in rural Australia with Indigenous groups. But really, period poverty is anywhere you look, on the streets, um, in, in schools who look after kids with complex needs. The idea is that our, our business will be as commercially successful as possible and then all of the leftover money after all of the costs and wages and everything are looked after, that's the money that can be repurposed into eradicating period poverty. We called Taboo Taboo because we wanted to call out that bizarre behaviour that our, that our community has entered into around periods. Um, we wanted to create a product that was bold. We wanted a logo that was bold and certainly not um, apologetic in the slightest. Uh, and calling it Taboo was saying, was trying to prompt people to question, why is this very natural bodily function a stigmatised issue? I love this work. Eloise, I absolutely love this work. Taboo <laughs> is calling out bizarre behaviour that our society has around periods and to my mind it's prompting people to question why this natural bodily function is so heavily stigmatised. Why briefly do you think it's stigmatised? 
It's a really hard question to answer because um, it just d doesn't make any sense that it is so stigmatised. Um, look, you could go into the, the patriarchy of our history and you can go into, um, I guess, well, the effects that period poverty has on half our population definitely feeds the inequality we have, um, which is, yeah, why it was so instinctive for us as two young feminists to pursue this mission and to, um, yeah, break down why, why it is in fact so stigmatised. Look, we don't really know the answer, but it has been stigmatised for history. And, um, you know, humans were quite simple creatures in that we just follow along with what we're told. Um, and when you're you're a young person and you're told that you have a period and that you can't really talk to anyone about it, you just don't. So it's just been gone unquestioned for a long time, but not anymore. <laughs> so as a young feminist, what does prosperity mean to you? I think um, it's it's shifted over time. Prosperity is a it's a funny thing. I guess I was born with a family who could afford to send me to school. They could afford to feed me. Um, I really had all of the human rights um, anyone deserves. So in that sense, I was already really quite prosperous personally. And when we started exploring the social enterprise model and also having a background in understanding the heartache and the poverty that a lot of people live through um prosperity doesn't make sense unless it's accessible um and unless it's an equal spread of opportunity uh, i i don't think we can have a prosperous society without an equal society um you know we need we need equality and we need social rights and economic equality for our democracy to function and for, for people to feel like they, they all have a place. So prosperity is, is nothing unless we're, we're, all, we're all in the same game. So Managing Director of Taboo, uh, I love anybody who has a Managing Director job title before the age of 25, <laughs> um, leading like a committed and, and quite an extraordinary team already. Let's just talk about your operations for a moment. So how are you scaling Taboo? What's the distribution? What's the reach? And, and what's the, the end game here? What are we trying to do? Yeah, so I guess to, to jump back to when we launched, um, we, we decided that we needed to sell a brand of pads and tampons because half our population were buying this product every month for about 40 years of their life. Uh, there's a big market there and we, we're, we're thinking, well, if, if we can sell a product in that market and uh, make sure the ownership of those profits are dedicated to our mission and we can eradicate period poverty with this money, we could maybe solve this thing. And perhaps there's a sprinkle of naivety in there, but I think we all need to have that childlike mindset on how we can um, attack the world's to-do list because you do need to have hope and you need to be um, a risk taker. So we thought, okay, why not? Let's just walk into this $400 million market and a seller and brand of product. And in that as well, we were, we were thinking, well, we're not going to sell a product that's, you know, covered in plastic and um, is almost hypocritical. If we have an agenda to solve a lot of these issues and period poverty being our specific passion, then, you know, we're not going to employ um, a, a company that engages in child labor or produces a product that's horrible for the environment. You know, we were really wanting to make sure there were no compromises along the way. So uh, yeah, we crowdfunded a whole, hum whole heap of money and that was enough money to purchase our first batch of product. And we've been selling our own range of certified organic cotton pads and tampons since August, 2019. Um, so it's been a few years. We've got an online uh, e-commerce service so you can pick which products you need every month and then we deliver that service to your door automatically um, and we also have a kind of business to business relationship not in a typical uh, retail sense although we do um, but we encourage workplaces to stock product for their staff we encourage schools to have product for their students universities for their staff and students um, so we want to look after industry and we're selling in um, a whole bunch of stores. I think there's about 250 stores in South Australia that are stocking our products. So keen to hit the retail game even further. Uh, we, we really want to grow into that market as much as we can because that's where the opportunity for us um, as a collective to make a difference is, is in that space. I mean, how big can this become? Because like you're, you're talking about like that size of that industry and I think, well, this is a product that a huge proportion of the, the population needs regularly. Um, where are you setting your sites? What, 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 where do you see this going? <laughs> well, 
um i guess in a in a commercial sense as as big as possible like there's in my in my um hope I see the social enterprise in all industries really taking over the market, um, especially if we're committed to producing a good quality product, as well as a product and a service that um, serves the environments and the communities we want it to serve. Um, of course, consumers, well, at least I have a hope that every everyone on this planet at least has a good heart. Uh, if they have a choice to support other people with their with their purchases, they will. So yeah, oh, we're we're ready to take over the market and you know grow with other social enterprises too. Um, I I just get so excited about the opportunity we have to solve these issues. Um, in terms of period poverty, there's it's it's appalling that period poverty even exists in Australia because we are so wealthy and we have so many support structures. But because it's such a stigmatized topic, still, I think it's about one in five menstruators will miss out on school or their work or they'll have to take time off because they can't access period products it's not even associated with the shame or the lack of workplace policy we have in place to take days off but because they can't afford or access period products so um i really want to see period poverty become a piece of our history at least within the next five years in australia and there's a lot of work to be done around the world as well um, there are a lot of cultural elements to period poverty. It's not just the provision of product or the provision of underwear, but there's a lot of education to be done, a lot of uh, yeah cultural progressions and opportunities to just um, navigate this very normal, very um, simple experience. But we just need to get human on it. We need to we need to have everyone on board. It's not just a women's problem. It's an everyone's problem. <laughs> Eloise, I'm sure there's lots of people who are feeling so pumped about hearing about this work. <laughs> and indeed, we can just get online right now and we can start ordering the products. Um, and also, I love the idea that we can pass on the products as well, you know, make sure that I'm thinking about young people, Eloise, young people in rural Australia, for instance, um, some that I've worked with who I know are living in this experience you've described. This is so important. Let's turn our mind very quickly to Brisbane 2022 the Social Enterprise World Forum. We're hosting this event and inviting people from around the world. What should the legacy be from this uh, forum? What, what do you want to say? I really want to break open the conversation about how we function as consumers um, and how our, our capitalist structure is designed. We know that it's not serving us in the way that it should at this stage. It's not an anti-capitalist sentiment. It's just a, there's room for us to improve here. We can really uh, deep dive into the into the concentration of wealth and why that exists and I think social enterprise plays a beautiful part in that way and um, I think we need to pull pull away our pre preconceived ideas on what social enterprise looks like and we can get excited about the big picture position it can it can play uh, and yeah it's going to be challenging but we have some amazing people um, to look towards like Muhammad Yunus for example um, there are so many social entrepreneurs out there that we can look um, to for for case studies and advice and just get excited about the really bizarre opportunity we have um, and yes it's going to make us feel uncomfortable but that's the only opportunity for change. We need to, you know, making new paths is difficult, uh, but in, you, you don't make change traveling with old paths. So we really do need to get creative and um, get uncomfortable in a, in a good way, in an exciting way. <laughs> Eloise Hall, thank you. The Social Enterprise World Forum believes in furthering the social enterprise movement as a viable, broad economic alternative for business globally. We are making a big difference in the world by demonstrating that there is a way we can do business that will tackle the most wicked issues we're facing today. The really important thing is what's the legacy impact that we can have when we move from country to country. Looking back over the last 10 years, I think the Social Enterprise World Forum has created a legacy in those countries where it has been hosted by bringing social enterprise leaders from around the world and building that ecosystem across the globe. The challenge and the legacy of the next 10 years is can we create local impact through a global movement? So we look forward to seeing you at the Social Enterprise World Forum to join us in growing a legacy of change.
For 14 years now, the Social Enterprise World Forum has been igniting global connection and legacy around the world. So, like, briefly, how do you reflect on the legacy of this crucial global event? Um, thank you, Bryce. Um, you know, like legacy has different meanings in different places. So the way we, you know, the way we work with um, partner organizations um, every year when we, you know, travel the world and, and bring um, these gatherings uh, in different countries and different communities is we really ask ourselves the question of, you know, what does impact look like uh, for you right now? Right. So um, impact is redefined every year um, as we work with with our host partners. Um, and there's threefold uh, to our um, impact model um, and they are connectivity, um, uh, capability and influencing. So growing connectivity, growing capability and growing um, the influencing uh, power of, uh, of our movement are always at play one way or another. But they just, um, you know, come up and um, I suppose they, they bring they be they are um, brought to life in in different ways and uh, matter in a different extent uh, depending on 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 the work uh, on the work we do with our host partners. Um, Christchurch, for instance, like back in um, twenty seventeen, um, is a good example of how you know we had quite a, a fragmented um, sector that really um, benefited from that springboard that you know the forum. Offers. Um, we put the spotlight on, on a movement that didn't enjoy much um, visibility at the time. Um, and it kind of turned into a renewed sense of um, you know, solidarity um, and confidence for our practitioners. Um, so the connectivity element was really important. And then uh, from an influencing point of view, um, it was the beginning of a, of a three year partnership with government to explore how we could work uh, more closely together to create the conditions for social enterprise to flourish. I mean, you were the director of that, that Christchurch edition. And I feel like the resonance, I can still feel it today. Like there is still legacy, a buzz movement from that edition. So you also have to now take on a global perspective with your um, chair role and, and, and to look across the whole board. So let's go to Brisbane 2022. What do you think we can collectively achieve? Oh, listen, I'm so excited about the forum coming to Brisbane this year. I mean, Australia is enjoying a very quite mature um, and organized um, ecosystem already, right? So, I mean, the work's been going on for over a decade and um, there are some amazing stories and I can't hear, um, I can't wait to hear more um, that that the world is gonna is gonna discover. I think, you know, the, the potential is, is in going even, um, even deeper, right? I mean, we've just heard it, um, you know, like there's just so much more we can do. So in terms of, you know, the connectivities, the partnerships can go way deeper and, and, and way more um, widely as well, like, you know, like influencing in, um, in further circles and um, in the wider, in the wider um, economy. Yeah, so and, and you know, the ripple effects of these events on the rest of the world are, are, um, are incredible. So, um, you know, the fact that this year we can have a hybrid event is extremely exciting. You know, the, the, um, the online um, element has enabled us for the last couple of years to really bring together a much more, um, you know, diverse community. Um, it's been incredible from an inclusivity and accessibility point of view. So we're really expecting to have an amazing range of voices um, part of the conversation. Um, so it's going to be the same this year, which is uh, extremely exciting. Um, and on top of this, you've got, um, you know, finally, after two years, three years, we are getting together again, which, you know, we can't ignore the, the magic of what happens in person as well. So yeah, this is really exciting. And um, and a lot of people all over the world will have their own um, community hubs as well. So it's a very important part of it, right? Like bringing these international stories and insights to your place and your community um, and reflecting and unpacking in order to be able to really apply it to your own um, context. So yeah, multi multi layers in that sense. Mark Daniels, we're going to come to you. You're the Chief Operating Officer at White Box Enterprises. You're a stalwart of this scene, but I believe you're excited because we're going to be bringing 
a new community, new perspectives to this Kickass event. Why the focus on the new? Why do we want to open the doors? What do you want to say? Um, good question, Bryce. Um, look, I think you know the social enterprise sector is. You know, there's there's these old people around who have been in the game for 20 years, like myself, and we're pretty. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We love what we do, and we want to keep doing it. What we're really trying to do, I guess, is to to fill out the sector. So there's a lot of social enterprises that operate that don't necessarily identify as a social enterprise, or they might identify more by the fact that they're a care provider than being a social enterprise, or they're doing really amazing stuff, and they might be at the fringes of what we would define as a social enterprise, but we think they're, they're, they're front and centre in this um, in the World Forum in terms of who we're trying to bring into the community. We want the community to be as big as possible, as loud as possible, and to um, uh, be really powerful as a collective. We were talking about CEOs of companies we might not have ever seen at a social enterprise World Forum before. We're talking about companies that might not have ever thought of themselves as a social enterprise. And that's, that's really what we're getting to. Now, the, the theme is co-creating our future. I want to get underneath that theme. And Mark, let me just um, come to some of the key points that sit underneath it and why are they important? So firstly, Indigenous social enterprise, First Nations perspectives. Why is that important? Oh, look, you touched on it before. I mean, you know, there's just so much to be learnt from, from Indigenous communities, but it's really Australia's social enterprise greatest untold story. Uh, they're amazing. They're in, in remote and rural and in urban centres. Um, we really want to shine a light on it. We want to learn from it and we want to capture the unique approaches and challenges that come from Indigenous social enterprises. Okay, the second point, unusual suspects. That was a fun one. Um, we were really trying to capture the fact that the sector is broad, it's very diverse, and quite often you're hearing from um, speakers who, who aren't necessarily that diverse and models that aren't necessarily that diverse either. So we really want people who are doing things that are, that are a bit different. So as I said, you know, it might be the care sector, it might be education, it might be an organisation with a really unusual mission or a really different way of achieving those missions but we want to hear from those groups. So it, it's not just the same voices that we're having um, uh, spotlighted at this event. Excellence and failure, what does this mean for you? Look, you know, conferences and, and forums like this are always about excellence. Um, and what was interesting is when we consulted people around uh, the program, they talked about failure more than they talked about excellence. So what, came through, I think, was can you get rid of the smoke and mirrors and share stories about what didn't work, even amongst the successes? So we want to know, we want to hear from the stars, but we want a, a no war, a warts and all version of that story. And we also want to hear about the failures. And, and, and that's going to be really central in people learning and moving forward. I mean, one that's on the, the, um, at the front of everyone's mind at the moment, climate solution. So what do we expect to see on that front? Yeah, be, be, that's right. It is on everyone's mind at the moment, and that's fantastic. And how often does this get the attention that it deserves in the social enterprise sector? Probably nowhere near enough. I think we, we tend to see the, the world through the prism in which our social enterprise operates. If that's about creating jobs for disadvantaged, if that's about supporting a, a particular community, or whatever it might be. And, and I think we really want to draw it back to what is happening in this space and what should social enterprises be doing in this space and really cultivate that dialogue. Finally, one close to my heart, policy and systems. Close to your heart, not necessarily close to everyone's heart, I have to say, um, but pretty close to mine as well. Look. We all operate in systems and in terms of the uh, social enterprise space, um, we, we want better systems so that social enterprises can flourish. We want the support of policy makers. So we'll, we want the Social Enterprise World Forum to be quite catalytic. We want to hear where great social enterprise policy exists and the ways in which all jurisdictions in Australia can actually support it. 
we want uh, we want to see change coming out of the World Forum. That's a really important ing- outcome for, for for White Box and for the for the World Forum more broadly. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Elaine. Now let's shift our attention to a group who are redefining prosperity and running an extraordinary business on country in APY lands in South Australia. This is the story of the APY Art Collective. I don't think I can truly explain the value of our art centres because it is our beating heart. So the APY Art Centre Collective has over 500 artists working on the APY lands today. Um, seven art centres like this art centre here at Jala Arts. The art centres are Aboriginal owned and governed. My name's Sky O'Mara, I'm the General Manager of the APY Art Centre Collective. This is an incredible community and an incredible art centre where about 60 Ananu artists work. There isn't a prestigious um, visual arts award that is handed out in Australia today without Ananu artists making up a significant portion of the finalists or indeed the prize winners. We're in a remote community, a good 1,500 kilometres from Adelaide, 900 kilometres from Alice Springs. On the APY lands, the art centres are the only source of non-government funds. And if you think about it, that's huge. Ten years ago, Jala Arts was earning around $400,000 annually. Last year, Jala Arts earned almost $2 million. This increase in income is reflected across all of the communities on the APY lands. So this year, we've seen artists travelling to New York, to Miami, to, to Asia for festivals. We've had artists attending their exhibitions in Switzerland. The international opportunities seem to be growing. We've been working with Westpac Foundation for a bit over a year now. I think without Westpac, we wouldn't be in the position that we're in today. We've felt really confident because we've had Westpac support at every stage through this scale-up period. It's a really exciting time and elders have worked very hard to grow their businesses. So the elders were interested in establishing a bush to boardroom model. The galleries in Sydney and now in Adelaide are run by an Indigenous board. Now there's two very distinct industry models. There's the Aboriginal owned and governed model and then the second model is a dealer based model. Now this model is usually run by non-Indigenous individuals. The name of the game is to make money for that company. So you're not seeing the commitment to that return to community or that return to Indigenous artists and their families. Everything here, everything in this gallery, goes back to those communities. Under the previous model, young and emerging artists of the APY communities would see a return of 36%. Under the new model that the elders have devised, these same artists are seeing a return of 60% of the retail price of their artworks. Our art centres allow us to be on land, and on the land we're keeping our culture strong. In this space, in our art centres, we know how to be strong leaders, and that's what that younger generation are constantly seeing, that we are powerful, that we are leaders, and we are strong.
last week I had the utmost pleasure of sitting down with Numiti Burton and Sky O'Meara from the APY Art Collective. Here is that conversation now. Numiti, there is an artwork behind you. It's a beautiful work, The Seven Sisters. Tell me about it. Well, I've accepted this cultural knowledge from my mothers and from my aunties and also from my fathers as well. In the cultural story of Seven Sisters, the, the older sister held some knowledge and Numidi's sharing with you that the older sister had knowledge that saved the younger sisters from dangers. Yumi is saying that this is an amazing cultural story, actually, because it's, it goes through so many different Aboriginal nations. So there's different songs in these different parts of the country. The Seven Sisters are seeing the different rock holes and the different water supplies on each country as they're travelling through. From start to the end, so the older sister is holding on tight and protecting those younger sisters the whole way through, from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. I think about this story when I think about our business and the company that we started here, the APY Art Centre Collective. Like the Seven Sisters, you're leading the way and you're taking young people and community, all of us, with you. So as a leader, how do you keep going? How do you keep focused? The immediate response to your question was, oh my goodness, I just want them to be happy. I want them to be happy and well. And she said, and it starts from here. It starts from, it starts from culture and work. And Numidi is saying, and they'll watch my Mara, and so they'll, they'll watch my hand and they'll watch me, and then I'll keep an eye on them and see what's working and what's good, and the new leaders will come forward and we keep going. Your artwork is all around the world, in, in New York, in London, in Melbourne. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, Numidi's saying it, it, actually, it actually thrills me that my work has travelled so far. Just going when I think about my work in New York, it makes my, my spirit feel, feel really, really pleased and really strong. Um, and it's because there's new people um, that will be seeing that work and, they, and I'm giving them an opportunity to learn something new. So let, let me ask you about the future. What do you hope for APY Art Collective and what do you hope for your community? We're in a better position now. We've got the confidence. We've learned some lessons. It's about independent income. It's about employment. It's about for our young people. And this will be this will be key to improved health. The work we're doing is continuing the work of the ancestors. Two extraordinary humans from APY Arts Collective. What a privilege it is to be part of this conversation today. Repurpose, how Australian social enterprises are redefining prosperity. And now to accompany winning the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world. It's one of my favourite Australian brands. This is the story of Who Gives a Crap? Hi, I'm Simon Griffiths co-founder of Who Gives a Crap. We reckon every trip to the bathroom should be a feel-good experience. So we've spent the last two years developing the only toilet paper that delivers one every time. Who Gives a Crap? It's a breakthrough on so many levels. Let me take you through them. It's better for the environment, and we've cut the nasties, so it's better for your body. That feels good. 
But unlike other recycled toilet paper, we're all about comfort. So it has a beautiful fluffy texture and low PTR or poke-through rate. That feels good. You can choose to buy it off the shelf or have it home delivered. Either way, it costs the same as other brands, but comes with 1200% more puns. That feels good. But here's where we're really on a roll. 50% of our profits go to sanitation projects in the developing world. You see, while a trip to the bathroom can be the ultimate feel-good experience for some, for many, it's not, because 2.4 billion people don't have access to a proper toilet. The bad stuff ends up in waterways, causing diseases that fill half the hospital beds in the developing world. That doesn't feel very good. And that's why we're donating 50% of our profits to WaterAid. WaterAid helped the world's poorest people access clean water, sanitation and hygiene education. They're literally saving the world from the bottom up. It's as simple as that. We take something that everybody needs and use the proceeds to help people in need. And that feels really good. Heading up Who Gives a Crap at Jehan Ratnatunga in LA, Danny Alexander in New York, and myself down in Melbourne, Australia. We're engineers and product designers who in 2010, through a shared passion for humanitarian aid and toilet humour, developed a business model that grabbed a lot of headlines and won a bunch of awards for entrepreneurship. We're busting to press go on the first production run and create Who Gives a Crap's first edition. Our feel-good toilet paper needs a feel-good price. And for that, we have to order in bulk. But we need $50,000 to make that happen. Basically, we need toilet paper. And like anyone who's waiting for toilet paper, we need someone to help us out. We're asking for your support. We need $50,000 to fill our warehouse with the first bulk order of Who Gives a Crap. And I won't be leaving this toilet until we've raised enough for our first order. I'm sitting down for what I believe in, and I'm not getting up until I've got some toilet paper. $50,000 worth. Till then, you can jump on our website and see me sitting right here on our live feed. So please, bit of help. Simon, you're not on the toilet anymore. I think you're uh, now maybe out in the kitchen or somewhere else. But let's get straight <laughs> into scale and impact. You know, that was, that was a, a couple of years ago. You've now got 164 employees. You're scaling around the world. What's the business model of who gives a crap and, and, and how do you measure impact? Yeah, so, um, you know, the business model is, is currently mostly direct to consumer. We sell home products with toilet paper as our lead product and then use half of our profits to help build toilets and provide access to clean water in different parts of the developing world. Um, so the, the, the way that we create impact is through others. And what we're really trying to do is, is get the most people with access to, to sanitation globally. In terms of how we track impact, it's actually a little bit hard for us because we um, have very intentionally taken the path of giving unrestricted donations, which means that you know we truly believe that's the way to maximize the impact that comes from our donations because we're not restricting how that money can be spent. But we're also not able to say we've specifically built that toilet block at that school over there, which will impact you know 800 kids or, or whatever it is. Um, and so it's quite difficult to put uh, you know human numbers to the to the donations that we're making because of the nature of our donations being unrestricted rather than restricted funding. Um, so it's a challenge that we wrestle with. We'd love to be able to you know put more um, human based numbers around what we're doing in terms of impact. Uh, we think that would make strengthen our marketing, which would hopefully allow us to acquire more customers. But we actually believe that to have the most impact, it makes sense to give unrestricted funding instead of restricted. I love that you're mixing, to my mind, like the best of being a for-profit company, an enterprise, scale, global reach, but also like a not-for-profit mindset as well, a charity mindset. How important is this head, hand and the heart in your work? Yeah, it's a, it's a really fine balance and something I was talking about this morning as we're you know, looking at um, our travel costs for the year ahead. And so I think that when it comes to growing the business and growing revenue and acquiring customers and um, you know, looking after our team in terms of, of salary and compensation. We think about all of those things in the same way that a regular for-profit business would. But then to thinking about our costs and, you know, what costs the business is faced with, we definitely take more of a, a non-profit mindset. And so in my mind, we kind of take the best of both worlds where 
Um, you know, we use all of the tools that are available to traditional for-profit businesses. And then we also layer in all of the additional benefits that you get from incentivizing to see, you know, the impact that comes from those decisions. So when someone buys our products, not only are they getting all of the traditional for-profit benefits that they would get from a traditional for-profit toilet paper company, but they're also getting all of these additional impact or non-profit based benefits that we offer by, by giving away the money that, that we make from our profits. And, and to be clear, we're not a non-profit. We are a for-profit. We give away half of our profits, but we sort of play in the middle ground of, of those two business models, which is kind of the special source that I think our customers really like about our business and certainly helps us to you know, attract and, and look after great team members as well. I mean, it's also been important for you. you. You've built a war chest over the last couple of years, you know, and you're beginning to do well as a company. But that war chest, getting the, the foundation of the business right, making sure that enterprise mindset was there, that, that seemed really crucial in, in, in the first couple of chapters of, of Who Gives a Crap Story. Yeah, so, so we've raised, um, you know, about 40 million Australian dollars uh, last year, which was the first external capital we'd really put into the business. Um, prior to that, we'd bootstrapped the business for about nine years. And so we, we truly understood what was required from a commercial level to make the business work. And we kind of held off putting any external capital into the business because we just weren't sure if a business like us would ever have you know what's termed as an exit that would enable a return on capital that was kind of entered into the business at you know an earlier stage i think last year we got comfortable that capital markets had shifted so much in 10 years that you know we thought in another 10 years we could potentially see an ipo or you know a trade sale occurring that would enable us further the path that we we're on to you know create you know impact at a faster rate than what we might be able to if we didn't tap into those markets and so we realized that it was the right time to put capital into the business to enable us to continue scaling at pace and achieve some of the big lofty goals that we have in front of us, knowing that you know, we were now able to sign up to that, that vision of you know, having some sort of a, um, an exit strategy in place that would enable our, our shareholders to be able to get a return on that capital that came into the business. But the lens that we would always use would be, you know, if we are going through an IPO or a trade sale or something like that in the future, it's with the, the goal of furthering the impact and the pace that we can have impact on this rather than just achieving a return on capital for investors. You know, you're a business that people frankly love. I, look, I do, my partner does, my uh, two-year-old loves the wrapping. Uh, what do you think has created this buzz? I mean, there is such word of mouth and I mean, there's genuine love for the company. So what creates the secret sauce, the buzz? <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's really nice to hear. I think, um, you know, there's there's kind of two ways that we think about this. And, and one is the, the initial idea that we talk about as being kind of like a three-legged stool where you've got um, the product, which is toilet paper, the brand name who gives and then the cause of, you know, helping to build toilets. And when you put those three things together, I think you end up with an idea that's so simple that people often say, with well, the first time they hear it, you know, I can't believe someone hasn't done this before. And that I, you know, that response of, I can't believe someone hasn't done this before, to me always says that you found something that's so neat and so beautiful that people will want the people about it. And so you've created a, an element of virality that, um, you know, will be able to you know, carry the idea forward. And then it becomes our job as a company to live up to the, all of the expectations of the customer and ideally over deliver on them with extra delight that we can insert around the customer experience that, you know, people are used to one experience where they're buying toilet paper from the supermarket and we're changing that customer experience and saying how can we make it better by delivering to their door by rethinking packaging by having seamless customer service when things go wrong by you know thinking about our copy differently and inserting jokes into everything we do by doing limited editions throughout the year and so by putting all of these extra element on the customer experience of the physical product we create something that has a very different um, you know rational set of benefits for the customer and hopefully an emotional set of benefits that is what makes people fall in love with something as well so we often think about designing a brand as a person that you can fall in love with and if we're really getting things right we're able to pull on those kind of emotional cues to create that emotion for our customers Simon, thank you for joining us. I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard this, but as a, sub a subscriber of Who Gives a Crap, I'll be thinking of you every day. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. We know from other jurisdictions, other countries, that when there is better organisation and some direction around the development of social enterprise, 
the sector and individual organisations really flourish. And this strategy is a way to thread the sector together and unlock that opportunity. In the report, you find a discussion on the vision and a mission-led approach for the sector. So we're talking about regenerative economy, local living economy, caring economy and inclusive economy. Social enterprise, it still feels like a bit of a best kept secret. So this is all about how do we take it to the next level? How do we build on what we've got? How do we really scale this and how do we do it for the long term so that we're creating something that lasts for the next 10, 20, 30 years? So what we'd love everyone to do from here is to read the reports, digest them, think about them, reflect on what that means for your work and your place in the social enterprise sector, and then think about how you might want to be part of creating this bigger picture that we're all aiming for here and being part of that ultimate vision. Jess Moore, we have an opportunity to move away from being a fragmented sector into being more connected, unified, and particularly speaking in one voice to government. Let's talk about why that's important and what this social enterprise national strategy is hoping to achieve. It's funny, Simon just said, I can't believe someone hasn't done this before. Um, and that just really resonated in terms of the work of, of the Social Enterprise National Strategy. Um, I think tail ending this uh, session today, it's, it's so easy to actually feel the gravity of the importance of this work. You know, you said we're, we're fragmented. Um, we are. Most people in this sector operate in a constant environment of scarcity and it's very hard to come together when we feel we're in an environment of scarcity. And I, I would also add to that, I think we're underserved. You know, I think business, uh, you know, government has grappled with how it can support business and it's created an enabling environment for business. It's grappled with how it can support charity in a lot of ways and similarly has created a structure around that. But social enterprise really straddles that business and purpose. And we desperately as a sector need an environment that enables us to, to unlock well, to support the sector and the amazing work it's doing and to unlock its full potential. I mean, that's what you're doing now with the national strategy, but it is an election year and people are going to be thinking to themselves, should we be seeing um, this work um, yielding right now? Like, should we expect announcements from government or opposition? Or is it going to be a much longer term perspective? Like, like what's the approach right now? Oh, it's a great question. So, um, Ideally, we would have a really well-developed national strategy in Australia right now by the sector for the sector, and we would be saying to government, you need to back this and resource this. But we're not in that position yet. So there was really amazing foundational work done by the UNIS Centre at Griffith Uni. And what it found is that, you know, right now, if government came to our sector and said, we want to put $100 million into this sector, we wouldn't even have a unified answer about how that money would best be spent. I know there's lots of people on this call today who would love to have a crack at answering that question, but as a sector as a whole, we need to be able to clearly say, this is the kind of environment we need and this is how we, how we need to be supported. Um, and so what the UNIS Centre put forward is basically how do we build foundations to be able to develop that strategy together? Um, and really it's, it's five things at the moment. The first is we need a shared vision and mission. So what is our shared direction? What is our call to action? Um, we actually need to design and, and set up a new fit for purpose organization that can actually hold this work and bring the sector together around this work. We need to establish principles of practice in terms of how we're gonna work together. Um, we need to profile and promote the value of social enterprise because sadly, there's still so many people in this country that that don't know what it is, including people who really want to see a, a better world. They're not yet seeing social enterprise as a tool for driving that better world. Um, and lastly, we're working to, to have an investment case to actually demonstrate the value and the public value of the sector to government as the basis for that conversation. And there's actually t t two of those pieces of work that are really underway right now. Um, so we're hoping to work through those things in the lead up to um, the World Forum in Brisbane in September. Um, but the first is right now, 
Uh, through lots of sector input, there's a draft vision and mission statement up online for feedback. And for people here, if you haven't seen it, uh, it would be really great for you to jump on LinkedIn, look at the Social Enterprise National Strategy and, and give us feedback on that. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd love to announce as much as it's a limited announcement today is that um, we've actually just incorporated a backbone organisation for this work. So it's going to be known as Social Enterprise Australia um, and it's currently in the, the final stages of business name registration with ASIC and just really wanted to give you all a sneak peek at the logo. Um, so it almost feels silly to explain it, but obviously this is designed to actually show the diversity and beauty across the sector and the connection um, that, that we're building and also at the same time provide a brand that enables us to speak both to the sector, to change makers more broadly, and, and to government with one, one voice. Bryce, you asked the question specifically about the federal government. And the, the key thing I'd say is we don't want to do a smash and grab at this point. An election's coming up and people want to say, we need this right now, but actually we're in the, the, the slow but important build work of getting clear on what the sector needs. And so really the election is an opportunity to build more broadly the profile of social enterprise with government, to build relationship with, with government, um, and to make sure we're on the government's mind as we get beyond the federal election so that, so that we can, over time, get a national strategy that's backed federally. Jess, we're gonna continue that conversation next hour in one of the breakout rooms as well, and I'm looking forward to that. But let me turn to Adrian for a moment, and I wanna finish this hour where we um, started the hour. And really, let's talk First Nations perspective for a moment here as well. And there's a difference in the perspective from First Nations in how to define social enterprise and how to, to define um, or quantify the impact of social enterprise. So remind us, what is this difference? Yeah, so uh, Bryce, firstly, as a Garangarang man, I wish to acknowledge that I'm actually calling in from Butchala country. Um, I actually wish to acknowledge the many traditional owner uh, lands that we are calling in uh, from today and uh, recognise that traditional owners uh, here in Australia, but also across the world, never um, seceded their sovereignty rights. Um, and you know, when we look at the, the social enterprise space, there is so much to be learned from First Nations people because um, social enterprise is really not something that sits out the side um, of our core, you know, life being is social enterprise is very much the everyday life for First Nations people. Um, so, you know, as you you, you were, uh, you know, kind of, you know, defining down into, you know, kind of what, what is this difference? Uh, First Nations people don't necessarily look at, you know, what is the individual benefit to be gained and accessed, uh, accessed. It's, you know, how does that benefit flow on to family, community, uh, land and the environment? And there is certainly, you know, um, you know uh, a significance of First Nations voices um, required in this space um, because of the learning you know, uh, you know, learning that First Nations people bring that social enterprise is an everyday part of our lives. But consequently and subsequently, it's the learning that we uh, will gain from the First Nations, uh, from the social enterprise space of connectedness and practice and the networking. Um, you know, and, and I think that's an exciting space for First Nations people uh, you know, uh, in Australia to be involved in something like this and certainly to have you know, so many First Nations people even represented you know, on, you know, in the, um, this early stage. Look, you've had an extraordinary history. I, I knew your work in, in Shepparton um, years ago, like 25 years of experience, Greenfield, social enterprises, you know, you've done it all. But I want you to just take this point where you're standing with all of this knowledge and experience. You know, what's your hope for the future? Because that's, that's going to really define in some ways what we try to set out to do in September and beyond. So from your perspective, what would you love to see in the future from social enterprise? Very much, I, I suppose, uh, in, in this, 
in the social enterprise space is the recognition of First Nations voices. Um, so if we were to just kind of boil down into, you know, one space uh, environment, uh, which is, you know, one of those key pillars that we look at in terms of social enterprise. Um, you know, I was reading, you know, uh, you know uh, publication just recently, which talked about how First Nations people across the world are the most impacted by climate change. We manage 70% of the world's land masses and yet are the least funded to actually carry on those managements. In any of the national and international conversations, the single absence at the table is First Nations voices. And so if, if social enterprise embraces, you know, um, environment and it embraces, it embraces um, you know, rights of, you know, of individuals, it embraces employment, well then certainly First Nations people need to have their voice at the social enterprise table. And that's what I would hope that Adrian. comes out of Brisbane. I um, want to thank you. We've, we've heard from some sensational humans today. What a pleasure it's been to have you and Jess Moore hearing that work around the strategy. Uh, to Simon Griffiths as well, the co-founder and CEO of Who Gives a Crap, Numidi Burton and Sky Omiara. Um, of course, Alain, um, the chair of the board of the Social Enterprise World Forum, Mark Whitebox, um, Eloise Hall earlier on from the, uh, uh, one of the leading social enterprises, Taboo. It's been an extraordinary hour. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. It's been invigorating, it's been thoughtful. To the team behind the scenes here, it's very hot in Digital Storytellers studio today. So I'm just gonna do this for a moment. Oh, thank you uh, to White Box Enterprise, to Torrens University, the Westpac Foundation, to all of our partners. A special shout out, uh, Mikey, for hosting us today here as well. It's a stellar effort. But this is only one part of the conversation and it continues now as we break out. And there are three things you can do. One, make sure you complete the post-event survey to enter the draw to win one of our four Homie packs valued at $200 each. Of course, Homie is a Melbourne-based streetwear social enterprise. Two, make sure you join us in Brisbane in 2022, September. Use the discount code LAUNCH for 15% off your tickets. Get online, book your tickets now at sewf2022.com. Three, the most important thing, stick around. Join the Conversations Network. We'll have two short breakouts that will be beginning on a mo in a moment on the Remo platform. My name is Bryce Ives. Thank you for joining Repurpose, how Australian social enterprises are redefining prosperity. I look forward to seeing you on this journey and meeting you in Brisbane in September this year. Bye for now. <laughs>